Okay, let's go ahead and get started here for the science live session. My name is Amy Defoe. I'm one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about evolution and evidence. This is going along with uh, biology semester two, unit four, uh, as we're talking about the topic of natural selection and using um, evidence to uh, show that that is what is happening with evolution here. Okay, before we get started, a couple things. Um, these are being recorded. It's being recorded right now. Uh, we record these sessions for lots of good reasons. The biggest one, of course, is that we know that you know everybody is busy and life is always keeping us going and going. And sometimes the times of these live sessions don't always work for you. And so we record them so that you can have access to them at a time that works better for your schedule. Um, so we have a YouTube channel, the Teacher Mentor YouTube channel that has all of the live sessions, all of the different courses collected in there, which is fantastic because as you move through this course and also as you get into new courses, or even if you want to explore other courses or topics, you can go in there and take a look at that. So um, today, as we're talking about evolution and natural selection, maybe you're just starting out in biology and you're not quite yet there. You always think about that in the back of your mind. You can go back and you can go to the mentor page and you can take a look at these live sessions as you're going through your courses. So it's a kind of a nice extra resource that we have to, to help you. So. Um, think about that every time that you're starting a new lesson or a new unit, working on an activity and you're maybe interested and want to know a little bit more about the topic or you want a little bit more information or you have a question about the activity or the assignment, take a look at the YouTube channel. I'm sure that there is um, a lesson that covers that and you can get some more of your questions answered there too. Okay. Um, thanks again for joining us today. A couple things about the feedback. You can mute yourself and you can unmute yourself. Um, with these live sessions, of course, our goal is to get any questions answered that you might have and give you a little bit more information about one of the topics in our science courses. But also it's that interaction piece um, between us being an online school. It's nice to have this opportunity where we can see each other and we can chat and we can have a conversation, um, a live conversation. So please, I encourage um, any feedback, questions, comments. I like that engagement that we can get through these live sessions, okay? If you do have background noise in the background, please do make sure to mute yourself just so that it doesn't come um, in through um, everybody to hear and then also in the recording, okay? Um, so again, you can mute and unmute. There's also a chat function where you can type in if typing um, instead of talking uh, works better for you. Go ahead and type in your responses, type in your questions there. So I'll be checking that throughout the session today as well. Okay, awesome, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's take a look first at our agenda for today. Here we go. So I like to break up the session kind of in this type of a format. So I usually start off talking uh, about um, the topic. So today's gonna be evolution, natural selection. And then I have a question and answer period. And this is where you can ask questions about, you know, the topic that we just talked about. But this is also an opportunity for you to ask questions about um, an assignment that you might be working on or a completely different topic. So that's just kind of a, an open forum for you to get any questions that you have answered. And then we'll come back together and we'll talk about um, evidence. We'll kind of go into our skill building portion. So we do a topic at the beginning and then we go into a skill. Um, the second portion, we'll be talking about using evidence and how evidence helps us um, prove or support an idea that we have. And then before we end with the session, another chance to ask questions and make sure you are set and ready to go for the week in science. Okay, take a look at this picture. I'm sure you've seen this before. It kind of seen it floating around quite a bit in different versions of it as well. What does this picture show to you? What do you think it means? Okay, I see somebody said a progression. Definitely, we see some progression, some some change moving. Okay, the relationships showing a relationship between maybe these two different organisms. So as you can see, we have a, a picture of, it looks to be some type of a, um, a chimpanzee or a, a, some type of a, a primate. And then we have, of course, 
what looks to be like a, a human on the end of it. And it's kind of showing a progression as maybe how these organisms have um, changed or evolved. So as we think about the word evolve, we are looking meaning to change, usually to change for a reason, usually in the environment. Let's go ahead. So evolution, what does that mean to you? Again, another one of those big, um, big topics that we hear lots of different uh, information, controversial at times. Evolution, what does that mean to you? To change. Mm -hmm. Okay, as we look this up in the dictionary, I always like to give the dictionary version to start with and then kind of break that apart. It says, the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of Earth. So again, we're looking at living organisms that they are how they have are thought to have developed and diversified. So we mean um, to change, be different from earlier forms during the history of Earth. Okay, um, I like to point out that they use the word uh, thought to have developed. Um, and again, this is an, it's an idea, so it's like a theory, okay? We've got evidence to help support this, but we can't say 100% sure. So we can't say like a law, it can't be um, proven, because because of course, because as we think about the history of Earth and we're talking about millions and thousands and years and long, long, long periods of time, we haven't been around. Humans haven't been around for that whole entire time and we haven't had a way to maybe record this as well. So again, we have to use evidence to come up with our, our thoughts and to help prove them. Okay, so we're looking at how living organisms are thought to have changed over the history of Earth. Okay, the word evolve, now let's break this down. Evolve means to change. So evolution is a theory, again, based on scientific evidence that describes how organisms change over time and over many generations. So again, it's not a quick um, boom, an organism changes, it evolved. It's again, over many different generations, over very long, long, long periods of time. Um, scientists believe that organisms have branched from each other and evolved into many different types of species. Evolution is not, let's get to that point, it's not about where life came from or where it started from, or that, you know, we've heard that you hear people say we came from monkeys, but it's rather that we have common ancestors. So again, thinking about a common ancestor and then branching apart or changing, evolving into um, the species that we are today okay so again thinking about evolution in terms of what we're talking about in science in biology now we're talking about hello welcome we're just getting started here on evolution uh, again we're talking about to change um, evolution change on how an organism changes over long periods of time and then I'm just going to go into the question about well, what would make an organism change why, why would an organism just stay the same the whole entire time. I'm gonna check this chat box here for just a second. Okay, we're good. Um, let's get to that. Okay, so how did this idea come up? How did it come to be? Kind of like the background of the topic of evolution. There's three main scientists that came up with this theory on evolution, Lamarck, Wallace, and Darwin. And so we'll start here with Lamarck here. He was the first one to bring up this, this whole connection to the giraffe, which I love. I love talking about the giraffe with evolution. It's such a good example. So in 1809, he proposed that he proposed a hypothesis to explain how species change over time. And this is known as the theory of acquired characteristics. He suggested that characteristics, traits, so you think about it, you look at my characteristics, my traits here right now, you can think I've got brown hair, that's a trait, characteristic. Um, he suggested that characteristics developed during a parent's lifetime were then inherited by the offspring. Um, to support his idea, he used the model of the giraffe's neck. He believed that the giraffe stretched its necks over long periods of time in order to better reach food on the trees. 
um, which then led the necks to get longer. And then when those parents with the longer necks had offspring, they passed that down to, um, to the new generation of giraffes. So I like the little blurb there. In other words, he believed that the hard work of the living organism would affect its offspring. Um, the giraffes that stretched their necks the most would have the tallest babies. This was kind of the first idea that came to be, and you know, it was great that he put that out there, but it was later disproved. Um, the whole idea about acquired characteristics or acquired traits, um, saying that the giraffes stretched their necks, the longest necks, but then they would pass that, that down. And it was because that the parents were stretching their necks or making their necks, we'll say, fittest, that then they were passing down. So um, his suggestion that we can change our acquired characteristics in our lifetime and then pass those down was is, of course, disproved. If you think about it, uh, an example that we might use in modern day times here now, if you lift weights, okay, and you're working and you're getting really, really big, lots of muscles, um, his theory would then say that then if you were to have offspring, you would pass down all of that hard work that you did. You would pass down those muscles to your offspring, which we know is not that that's more of a, uh, a nurture characteristic that you're doing those things in your lifetime. So he was the first one again to kind of come up with this idea about passing down traits to the offspring. But again, he started the conversation, started the topic, but it was later disproved. Talk about Wallace. Um, he did extensive field work in the Amazon River Basin, and he noticed that many of the plants and animals had special features that helped them survive the conditions of the Amazon. These observations led Wallace to develop a theory about how species of plants and animals gradually change through a process known as evolution or natural selection. His theory was developed at the same time as Charles Darwin. So here we're getting into what we know of now today. That again, as we look at variations in species, and they have these special features that help them um, survive in their environment, but the ones with the best ones survive and will pass those down. Okay, and of course, Darwin, I'm sure you've heard this, seen his picture, heard about his book. Um, he started, he studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh in 1825. So as we can think, um, this timeline, this all started, we're thinking in the early 1800s. Uh, Darwin journeyed aboard the famous HMS Beagle on a science expedition around the world. Um, during this voyage, he discovered many fossils of extinct animals that were similar to modern species. So as he was seeing this connection, that there are similarities between these different species of organisms. Um, he made it to the Galapagos and it was here that he found many variations in plants and animals that helped him to realize his theories. He published a book in 1859 called On the Origin of Species and the book introduced the idea of natural selection, a process by which organisms change over time as those best suited to their environment survive to pass their traits on to the next generation. So again, survival of the fittest, this is where we get it from. The organisms that are best suited to their environment, best suited meaning um, they have the best characteristics or features that help them survive in the area that they live. Uh, a pretty famous study that he did was the finches of the Galapagos Islands. And one thing that he noticed was, um, you know, on this island that there was many different species of a finch. And he noticed small differences about the finches and it made him wonder well, why, why wouldn't they all just, you know, be one similar species of finch. And the reason being is we'll think about what all organisms need or what they compete over in their environment. Resources, food, right? So these organisms, for them to survive, instead of competing against all of these finches, they were rather um, competing to a specific species based off of um, the need. And this is what the, the need they're looking for or what they went with was um, what type of food that they would eat. So what you'll notice about these different finches is their beaks. So how these finches were able to get the food that they needed to survive and then pass on their traits to the next generation, um, their beaks changed 
They evolved over time so that they could eat different types of food sources. So you had finches that um, would eat, you know, fruit, and you can see kind of how the beak is a little bit different here. You had other ones that were insect eaters. Um, some would eat cactus and some were seeds. And so for them to best be suited to get the foods that they needed, um, their beaks had changed so that they could were able to compete in that sort of sense of a smaller grouping and compete over a specific type of food source. So if you think about it, if all of these finches were seed eaters, there wouldn't be enough seeds for all of them to survive. And so a majority of them would die. So these organisms evolved. They changed over time to begin eating different things and to allow them to eat different things, the shape, the style, the length, the tip of their beak changed or evolved as well. Phylogeny. Um, thinking about evolution, we talk about phylogeny and that, that's just kind of looking at the history of an organism. So organisms have a lot of common because of all the similarities be between all living organisms, it's believed that organisms have common ancestors. So again, as we look at, um, like Darwin did, is he looked at organisms that were extinct and organisms that were living that he saw, he saw similarities between them. And this helps us believe that there's this common ancestry and that then from there, we branched out or developed into new species through evolution to better suit the environment that each one of the species lived in. Uh, Darwin saw similarities between modern species and species that are no longer living. And he developed his theory based on evidence, um, fossil evidence, and again, those field observations that he saw as he observed all of these different species of organisms in different types of environments. Evidence suggests that all organisms are genetically related. So if we look at the DNA of organisms, we can see connections and similarities. Um, we can take that DNA and kind of make it into what we call an evolutionary tree. We'll see a picture of this in just a second. Uh, and this represents the phylogeny of organisms or the history of the organism's lineage as it changes over time. Phylogeny shows us that different species arrive, are, arose from different um, the previous generations and that all organisms from the smallest bacteria to the largest plants are linked together. Okay, so here an example of a phylogeny. And again, um, phylogeny, we use the term kind of like a tree as we think about how it branches out and branches out into different um, species, but they're all connected. You think about that into that stem, so to speak. So again, if we're looking at a very basic um, phylogeny example here, we've got you know the simplest or the oldest forms of, of life using these bacteria. And then over time, these organisms evolve or change to better suit their needs and their environment. They become more complex and they evolve and they branch into other types of organisms. But again, they all come back into together as having this common ancestry. Okay, um, in activity 431, they have a couple questions and these are a couple questions that I've seen. Students have some questions about, so I wanted to go over this just a moment. Sorry, I'm using a different computer here today, so. <laughs> looking all around for what am I looking for? Okay, so looking at number one here, evidence suggests that all organisms are genetically, genetically related. And again, I'm saying evidence suggests that all organisms are genetically related. And that is true. Evidence does suggest that based off of DNA evidence, we can see um, the relationships and see that organisms are related together because of the similarities in the DNA. The slow change in organisms that occurs over many generations by the passing down of inheritable traits is called Evolution, genetics, natural selection, and phylogeny. It is evolution, a very slow change in organisms that occurs over many generations by the passing down of inheritable traits. That is evolution. Evolution. 
Lamarck developed the theory of natural selection. I think this one gets a little bit tricky. Um, that is false. He developed the theory of acquired characteristics. So again, he was the one that developed the idea that um, we can work through, we can change our bodies or change our characteristics in our lifetime, and then those are passed down to um, the offspring. But we know that's not true. Um, as we think about um, genetics, as we're passing down our traits, those are clearly defined in our genes through our DNA. We do know that all organisms have variations and those variations can allow one, um, uh, uh, one species to be, I don't want to use the word species, what's the word I'm looking for? When, um, <laughs> one organism in the species could have a variation that makes them better suited to their environment and then therefore they survive and pass on those best suited um, variations, traits. Darwin's famous voyage took him to that is the Galapagos. And you might be wondering, well, why do they use the Galapagos? Why do we hear so much about the Galapagos Islands? Why is it such a special place? Well, um, the reason is because it's, it's, it's very secluded, private. So it's an island off of um, the coast of Ecuador, so on the Pacific Ocean, on the western side. But um, it's not connected to anything else. And so the species that live there, you know, are very isolated. And so it's a great place to study because you can see very uh, different species living there with very different features and variations. Okay. Darwin published on the origin of species. This book introduced a process by which change over time, organisms change over time, and those best suited to their environment survive to pass their traits on to the next generation. And this is known as natural selection. So the environment is naturally selecting the organisms that are best suited to the environment to survive. So the organisms that have the best traits or characteristics to live in that specific ecosystem, population, environment will survive and pass on those chosen traits. The history of an organism's lineage is it changes over time is called phylogeny. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here for a moment and see if there is any um, questions, either about what we're talking about here. I'll talk a little bit more about evolution and ev evidence here, but I wanted to pause for a moment and have you have an opportunity to ask questions if you might have any about this, or again, if you have questions about um, where you're at in your course or an activity that you're working on right now, kind of an open forum here for you to get any questions you might have. Answer. Okay, so again, you can take yourself off mute or you can type in in your chat box. Um, I will come back to questions at the end too. So if you don't have any questions, don't worry. You can save them to the end. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about evidence. Why is it so important? <laughs> what does it mean? Evidence. To prove something, right? So if you, so if, if you come up with an idea and you say it, you know, you need evidence to back it up. It, it's proving that something happened or proving that something is correct. So again, defining the word evidence, it's the av available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. Evidence help, uh, helps us prove something that is correct or not correct. And it's important because in some instances, we were not there or we cannot know the exact details or see it with our eyes. As we're talking about, um, like with evolution, um, for a lot of these changes, we haven't been, humans haven't been around or, or collected data or evidence to prove this. So we have to look at other means to help us answer these questions. 
we of course use evidence, not just only in looking at evolution, we use ev evidence in our daily lives. Can you guys think of some ways that evidence is used? We're so used to using evidence, and we probably don't even think about all the different ways. And there's a list right there. So um, in crime investigations, we use evidence, DNA evidence, right? Um, different theories in science, we use evidence to help prove something. Or the theory of continental drift. So again, this idea that the or that all the continents were once this giant supercontinent called Pangaea, and then they slowly drifted apart. We have to use evidence to help prove that because, of course, this happened long, long, long time ago, and the humans were not around. So that evidence helps us prove again an instance where we were not there to record or see it firsthand. The Big Bang theory: how the universe began. We have to find evidence to help prove that. Plate tectonics, the reason on why we have, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes. And of course, evolution. Okay, so what evidence do we have for evolution? So we looked at these three scientists and looked at their kind of, their ideas. But what's the evidence behind it? What do they have to support themselves or back it up? And the biggest one is looking at genetic genetic information. So looking at that DNA. So scientists compare DNA from living organisms to identify similarities among species. So again, we can look at DNA and we can look at the similarities between organisms and see how similar or different they are. The more similar, the more closely related these organisms are. So we can examine ancient DNA from fossils um, and it provides examples on how some species evolved from extinct ancestors. By looking at DNA, scientists can also determine how closely related organisms are. Again, similar DNA also suggests common ancestry. The diagram below provides an example of primate DNA comparison. So the, present, the percentages represent how similar our DNA is to each one of these different types of primate species. So again, here we have human. And again, we're looking at, again, looking at kind of a phylogeny here, looking at the tree. And so again, we're talking about having some ancestral primate, okay? A long time ago, we're talking millions of years ago, okay? And then here's our present day species of primates, humans, chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan. And here you can see how closely um, related, pretty crazy to think that our DNA is that similar. Just that small difference makes us into a completely different species, okay? So here we can see um, some little diagrams moving around on me. Uh, we've got ourselves, and compared to a chimpanzee, we've got about 98.2% of the same similar DNA. So you can see that we are the most closely related to the chimpanzee, okay? And then again, the gorilla and the orangutan. So what the phylogeny shows us is that there's some type of uh, ancestral primate, early ancestral organism that we branched off from or our common ancestor that we all came from. And that from here, environmental changes in the environment, we'll talk more about natural selection in another live session and another unit, next unit, unit up, unit five. And from here, from that ancestral um, species, we branched out and from here they branched, you could see that the gorilla went this direction, humans went this direction, and then from this branch, we had a difference between the humans and the chimpanzees. So again, branching away from each other to create a new species. Okay, some other evidence for evolution, we can look at structural evidence, um, homologous structures, vestigial structures, and of course the studies of embryos. So homologous structures, those are structures that are similar in origin and structure. They provide structural evidence for evolution. Although they have different functions like swimming, flying, and walking, each of these structures are made up the same. So example, so we're looking here at, you know, um, some bones. So we're looking at structures in a bat, a whale, a cat, and a human. And if we look at this, you can see they're color coded. These are the different types of bones or the names of the bones that you would find in, um, say, an arm or a limb. Okay. So here's our human. 
And then you can see the cat and the whale and the bat. And so the structure is exactly the same, looking at the, the humerus bone, the radius, all the way down to the phalanges here. So the structure being all similar suggests that again, common ancestry and then branching to suit the needs of the environment, to swim, to fly, to walk on all four, and ourselves. Vestigial structures, these are structures that don't seem to have a function, but we have them. Can you think of any in your body that you might have a vestigial structure, a structure that you have that really has no function, or maybe it did have a function and we don't use it anymore? If you thought of the appendix, that's what we're looking at, yeah. Um, the appendix to, appears to be the small version of sesame, which is an important part of the digestive system of many mammals. It's believed that vestigial structures were once functioning in that common ancestor, and then again as the organisms evolved and branched away from that common ancestor, they changed and was no longer needed. So maybe in a common ancestor of ours, that appendix, again, like they said, uh, was an important part of the digestive system. So having those structures shows that common ancestry. Uh, the study of embryos and their development is called embryology. Similar, similarities in the embryos show this evidence of evolution. The embryo is the earliest growth stage of an organism. And so here, if you look at this picture, we're looking at the embryo from a fish, a reptile, a bird, and a human. And if you notice, they look almost exactly the same. <laughs> same structures. Same shape, so to speak. Pretty cool to think, pretty cool to see. So again, showing, again, a common ancestry here. That similar structure. Fossils, another piece of evidence for evolution. Fossils are the remains of organisms that have once lived. Fossils can provide evidence for evolution by showing us how an organism has evolved over time. Um, consider the horse, as you'll see in this image. The fossil record of the horse shows how the organism changed over time. Um, check the image to see these changes. Pretty cool. It's believed that the horse grew larger, taller, and lost toes to gain hooves due to the change in environment and conditions that it lived in. So again, earliest ancestor here of the horse, again at 50 million years ago, and again we had fossil evidence of the remains from these organisms. So again, much smaller, shorter, <laughs> again, toes rather than a hoof. And then of course, as evolution has occurred and over time, as we get closer and closer to modern day, we can see the organism began to get bigger, taller. And again, it's going from, looks like I have four toes to three, to one main, to that hoof. And again, changes in that environment are their conditions that they lived in. Uh, maybe living in an area rocky, flat. So again, looking at a common ancestor and then looking at these slow changes, again, we're looking at millions of years, slow changes into the modern organism species that it is today. So evidence here on Earth, um, the fossil record, and it's pretty important to us in science, the fossil record here on Earth is extremely important in understanding Earth's history, and it provides us with evidence for evolution. So again, as we're thinking about what Earth's history, 4.6 billion years, when we think about how long humans have been around, not very, very long. So we have to have clues, we have to have evidence that shows us what the history of the Earth is, or what has occurred over time. And we use, we use the fossil record to do so. So it provides us with a glimpse of Earth's geologic history. Scientists use practice like radio, related, uh, relative dating, radiometric dating to determine the age or layers of rocks. Most fossils are found in sedimentary rock. So that's rock made from sediment that's pounded and pounded and grouped in together and layered and layered and compacted. Um, and these get cemented over time. And over time, it forms these layers in the rocks. We use relative dating as the idea that the lower or the bottom layers are the oldest, and then the layers on the top are the youngest. Think about new sediment being pushed down on top of it. The youngest is gonna be up on the top, 
the oldest layers are going to be at the bottom. So we can use some relative dating, thinking about relatively, which is older, which is younger. Within these layers, scientists can learn about geologic events like volcanic eruptions, weather patterns, and create a timeline of living organisms on Earth. Pretty cool to think that just these layers of rock can tell us about, you know, when an eruption occurred based off of what they find in that sediment or what the weather patterns were like. Was it a period of a drought? Was it a very wet climate? Okay, uh, we do get more specific with like radiometric dating where that's looking at kind of um, radioactive decay. So how much carbon is left behind? We use that for fossils to get more of an exact date of how old a fossil is. And they can use uh, radiometric dating to see how much of an element is left behind. The fossil record lets us look at organisms that were once living and compare them to current living organisms to see their similarities and how they evolved from each other. For example, paleontologists often compare today's elephant to the mammoth, an extinct elephant-like organism to help support evolution. The fossil record provides us with a glimpse into our own evolutionary history. You can see this image below shows us what we call a cladogram for early human ancestry. And so it's looking at all of the variety of living organisms, life on earth, and it's slowly showing kind of again that branching out, that um, phylogeny of how these organisms evolved and branched away from each other. So in this one, we've got very simple sponges, um, the worms, and here we've got the chordatas, which would be the, um, the branch that humans would be a part of, the chordata backbone. So these would be organisms that have backbones. Fossil evidence also provides um, evolution by looking at geographic distribution. So the figure shows the different species of ant anteaters, and you'll notice that they're um, different characteristics, but they're, they're similar to the same type of organism. So different species here, but again, an anteater being the organism. This shows how each evolved to, again, fit the surroundings of their environment, but they all stemmed from that common ancestor. And of course, this is evidence for continental drift. So again, as we think about the Earth, the continents on Earth, all the land masses being this one. That's where our common ancestor is with the sand anteater. And then as the continents have slowly drifted apart, and again, they, the continents then changed based off of their geographic region. You know, you're gonna get areas where it's colder, areas where it's warmer, wet, ice, you know? And over time, those organisms are going to evolve to um, be better suited to the environment that they are in. And that's how we get those different species. These species have evolved to be better suited to the environment that they live in. Let me think a little bit here on human evolution. So as we think about how humans um, have evolved, we one thing they look at is, of course, the skulls of humans and common ancestors of humans. And if you look at this picture, definitely, you'll notice here is modern day, early ancestors. You'll notice, what do you notice? Our brains got bigger, that's right. So over time, as our um, human ancestors have evolved, brains got larger, we got smarter. <laughs> so you can see this, this skull, um, larger skull to hold that larger brain. Uh, looking at the bone structure, from common ancestors to humans. Um, one thing they look at is the hips, going from an organism that was um, where we are now upright, bipedal walking on two, to an organism that had hip bones that were flexed down so that it could walk on four. Okay, so a little touch about what exactly um, evolution is, and again, we're talking about not where an organism came from or the origin of an organ organism, but rather we're looking at common ancestry and how organisms change over time to better suit 
the needs of their environment. And they change by small features or variations that they have in the traits, like with the giraffe, and we'll talk more about the giraffe in the next section on natural selection. But again, as you think about competition over food, the giraffes with the longer necks are gonna be the ones that are able to you know, reach higher up into those trees and competition. The ones that can get the food and have the longer necks are gonna be able to ones to um, get food, be able to survive. Therefore, they pass on those traits, that variation, having a longer neck to their offspring. So over time, the population or the species of giraffe, their necks get longer and longer as the ones that are best suited to the environment with the longer necks survive and pass on those traits for that longer neck. Okay, so again, we're talking about how an organism changes to suit the needs of their environment for them to survive based on the characteristics that they have. Again, not talking about where the organism came from or um, how it was created, okay? Okay, so again, we'll move along into um, the next time we come about in the live session, we can talk more about um, natural selection, which goes into looking firsthand at these um, changes and variations in these populations of species, okay? Okay, so we talked about evolution, what evolution is, and kind of the evidence for evolution. And again, thinking about kind of in our skill, we talked about using that evidence. So again, in daily life, we use evidence, but also thinking about in science, we use evidence to prove that something occurred. Um, we use evidence to kind of help support our ideas and prove it as a reliable source, okay? So again, not only do we use that in science, but we use it in our daily lives as well. Does anybody have any questions? Again, you are welcome to use your chat. You can use, you can unmute yourself, just talk out loud. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and keep talking. You know, as you're moving through your courses and anytime you have questions, you don't have to wait until the live sessions. You are more than welcome to, you know, and I encourage you to shoot a message to your teachers. You can send us a chat, an email, um, Google Voice, whatever your preferred method of communication is. We're here to help support you guys. We're here to help you guys reach your goals, getting through these courses. So anytime there's a question, please reach out to us. Also, if you have ideas for a live session, if you have um, a topic that you'd like to see more information or would like a little bit more um, instruction, maybe on an activity, let me know. And I would love to take that idea, and create a live session for you on that. Okay. Well, thanks for joining. I hope this was informative on evolution and evidence. Have a great week. Again, let us know if you have questions and we'll see you next time.